The last week, I met a friend, James, for a quick coffee. He was coming from an important networking event and from the moment I laid eyes on him, I knew something was wrong. He explained to me that the event he'd been to had been a complete disaster and that it would probably have a negative impact on his career progression. My heart went out to him as I knew he'd been struggling a lot recently and I asked why he thought it had been a disaster. He went on to tell me all the details of the terrible conversations he had had with important decision makers in his company. After listening to everything he had to say, I realized that he hadn't been to a bad event, but rather he'd been bad at the event. It was clear to me that the problem was him. He hadn't been a good conversation partner and therefore he had sabotaged his ability to impress and his opportunity to progress. We've all been there, right? Either as the speaker or the listener, we've all been in a conversation that was boring, one-sided, overbearing, awkward, or just plain difficult. I wanted to help him and I needed to break down what it takes to be an excellent conversation partner in a simple way for him to understand. Now, what I told him changed his perspective completely and quite likely has changed his life and career trajectory for the better. Now, I'm going to share these same six do's and don'ts of how to be an excellent conversation partner with all of you. Number one, do listen. Here are two well-known English phrases. See if you can figure out what they mean. You have two ears and one mouth. Use them in the appropriate ratio. Empty vessels make the most noise. It's so important to be a good listener. Huh? And I mean, you have to actually listen. Yeah, I always listen. You have to actively listen. Oh, that's nice, dear. Huh? Active listening means that you are 100% focused on what the other person is saying. Now, I know what you're thinking. This doesn't apply to me. I am a good listener. Well, I'm going to challenge that and suggest that maybe you are not quite as good at listening as you think you are. In a balanced conversation, you'd assume that you spend half of your time listening. But what about a great conversation? Well, to make your conversation partner feel valued, you may want to listen to them more than 50% of the time and ask more questions than make statements to give you more opportunity to listen to what they have to say. Question. When listening to someone, have you ever found your mind wandering, thinking about what you're going to have for dinner or what time train you need to catch? If that ever happens, you are not actively listening. Have you ever been listening to someone speak and at the same time been thinking about what you want to say next? As soon as that person stops talking, you'll say it. Then you're not really listening. What I've just described is passive listening. You are listening to the words, but you're not really thinking about the meaning, intent or understanding from the speaker's perspective. You're thinking about it from your perspective, your agenda and what you want to say in response or in retaliation to what they've said. A passive listener will make a perceptive speaker feel self-conscious and uncomfortable. So to be an active listener, you need to get out of your head and into the head of the speaker. Stop thinking, just focus 100% on the person speaking, on their words, their meaning, and their understanding of what they're saying. Give them the gift of your full attention and they will feel really special and understood when they're spending time with you. Number two, investigate, don't interrogate. To become an active listener, you have to invest your time and attention to understand the perspective of your speaker. You will need to understand why they think they're right. 
but you mustn't interrogate them and try to find ways to tell them that they are wrong. So how do you do that? Ask follow-up questions. Here are some general follow-up questions that you might ask in a general positive conversation. That's amazing. Had you ever been to that country before? Oh, you're a big fan of Disney films. <laughs> Which one's your favorite? You mentioned that you are at college. What are you studying? But if someone's mentioned something you completely disagree with, you could ask follow-up questions like this. That's really interesting. Where did you hear about that? I've never met anyone with that point of view before. Could you tell me more? I've always been told that the world is round, but I'm open to hearing more about your opinion. Truly listening to someone requires you to focus on them rather than yourself. And asking your partner for more details shows that you are really interested in what they have to say. Again, making them feel all warm inside, making them feel special, and making it seem like their opinions and views are valued and of interest to you. Now, you don't need to ask a follow-up question every time, otherwise your partner may tire of talking about themselves non-stop. So, be sure to share some of your own experiences and opinions too, but stay on topic and don't disrupt the conversation or go off on a tangent. Number three, don't disrupt the conversation. What do I mean by disrupt? A great conversation is like a tree with branches reaching out in a lot of different directions, all stemming from the main body. You can go back and explore other branches, but you should never suddenly jump to another tree. Disruptions can be intentional, which will be perceived as rude, or they could be unintentional, which can be jarring, frustrating, awkward, and unpleasant for your conversation partner. Let's consider a couple of examples of conversations getting disrupted. Here is an intentional disruption. So the recommendation is that you're supposed to exercise at least three times a week. <laughs> and, Sounds a bit much. Well, I've been doing yoga every single day for the last year and I love it. Have you ever done yoga or Pilates? Um, how do you feel about cats? Because uh, I've got a cat and... Uh... Oh, look at her. Look... Oh, hang on. <laughs> look at this one. You can see that B disrupted the flow of the conversation. He led the conversation in a completely new direction. In that example, it was intentional, which is quite rude. Sometimes though, we can unintentionally disrupt a conversation too. Let's have a look at another example. Really, that's amazing. It's a medical miracle. <laughs> Do you know, there have been so many breakthroughs and scientific advances over the past yeah. few years. I was reading just the other day about this, uh, the space race, the modern space race with uh, Richard Branson. He's taken civilian passengers into space. It's <coughs> mind-blowing. You don't actually believe people went into space, do you? I bet you also believe that people landed on the moon. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, what? Dismissing what your partner has to say as wrong or crazy is a surefire way of disrupting the flow of a conversation. In this second example, the unintentional disruption both dismisses the opinion of and insults the speaker's perspective, while changing the subject from technological innovation to conspiracy theory. Number four, don't hog the conversation. This means don't talk constantly. Now, I'm sure that what you have to say is very interesting, but unless you're in a lecture theater, remember to keep your speeches short. You will bore your conversation partner if you don't give them an opportunity to contribute. Just remember, it takes two to tango. And to continue the dancing analogy, even if you are the lead. That means guiding your partner through the moves, not muscling yourself to the middle of the dance floor to show off your fancy moves and your tight trousers. It's an unfortunate truth that people are more likely to change their mind or take an idea forward if they think they came up with it themselves or at least contributed. Therefore, 
even if you are the smartest or the most informed person in the room, people will still respond best to you if you lead them like a good dance partner to their own epiphany through insightful questions, not monologues. Number five, don't deflect questions. Deflecting questions is the bread and butter of the political elite. I'm sure you've watched a news anchor ask a politician an important question, only for them to answer a completely different question, huh? Now having the ability to deflect questions in itself is a fantastic skill to have. It can be very useful, especially if you work in the public eye, because sometimes questions are not appropriate, or you may not know the answer, or they're just not the kind of question you want to answer at that time. But in a conversation, if you deflect a question, it can come across as very obvious and disingenuous, and people don't like it. So in a conversation, if you can, try to avoid deflecting those questions. Just tell the truth. Number six, be positive. Now let's return to my friend James. I mentioned that he'd been struggling a bit recently and I know that he'd taken the weight of the world with him into every conversation, each conversation getting heavier and heavier with every unsuccessful interaction. To be a great conversationalist, it's important to be positive in your demeanor, your conversation topic, and the light that you shine on your conversation partner. We've all got that friend or relative who we speak to from time to time who answers questions like, how are you? With, oh, you know, getting by. Or just by starting off with bad news. These sorts of interactions are best left for your nearest and dearest if and when you need them. People naturally want to hear about interesting, exciting and happy events in people's lives. Certainly when it comes to business and personal networking, the old adage of wear the clothes for the job you want, not the job you have. This can extend to your conversation style too. So if you're going on a date, a networking event, and especially if you're going to an interview, present your best self, the positive, charismatic side of yourself that sees the best in others. Your positivity is contagious and people will enjoy being around you and they'll want to come back for more. So where is James now? Well, I've heard he followed up with someone from the networking event and went for a coffee chat. With his new approach, he was able to have a great conversation and he has been referred for an interview next week. Yes, well done, James. If you found any of the tips in this video useful, please give it a like. And if you have any additional tips on how to be an excellent conversation partner, please add it to the comment section below. If you struggle to find opportunities to practice your conversation skills in English, then maybe you want to consider joining my conversation club. A number of times a week, I bring together a group of like-minded students who are all learning English and want to improve their conversation skills. I set a topic with some pre-reading, so they have to do a little preparation. And then we get together on a Zoom call and I put everyone together into smaller groups so everyone has a wonderful chance to speak in English, make new friends and have a nice time. And we'd love to have you join us. So if you're interested, click on the link provided. Until next time, take care and goodbye.